This is uh, Drew Spence from the Dynamic Universe in lieu of my media editor, Griffin Avid. What's good? Uh, this is about a conversation I've just had called The Value of Art. I've had this with a few of my friends, and it's about judging the value of art or a piece of work. And uh, this is a pattern that I've seen from the music production world, and now that I'm doing a lot of comics and art and other things, I'm just seeing those trends follow us over here. And I think it's kind of important to sometimes get ahead of an idea so you kind of know what you're working with. And this is about pockets of artists, pockets of creatives, um, and a reflection of what happens when you put these groups together in mass numbers. And it's important because it also relates to forums, Facebook groups, um, galleries, pretty much anywhere, uh, fans debating on a YouTube video clip. This kind of stuff kind of reaches across all the different areas that you might find yourself in. So I've always thought it was interesting to sort of take a look at what that is. So first we'll take a look at the value of art and we'll put that down as our first thought. And that becomes the question of how do we judge art? How do we value it? How do we understand our place in the process? So we'll start at the top of it is the artists themselves. The artist, the person who's actually creating the art is pretty much at the top line because that begins the process. And you'll see the whole circle reconnect, but you get the idea of the artist at its purest form is the person that begins the value by actually creating it. The next level we're gonna look at is the critic. If my spelling goes off, you have to understand I'm doing one of the things I say to never do, which is type directly in Photoshop. So I actually should be copying, pasting this from a Word document, but we're here and we're together and we're family, so. If I hit you with a typo, you'll just have to understand that, you know, that'll be okay for today. So we have critics, which is the middle ground of it. And uh, the final destination is the fans, people that's going to judge the work in its finished form and gain an appreciation for it. So those are the three parts that it starts. The artist is important because they're the ones that actually do the process. And as part of the process, we have to be aware that sometimes that becomes an obsession with a process itself. Where you begin to, uh, you put artists together in a big group, they begin to decide the value of art based on the process of creating the art. And again, that's early. So we haven't even gotten to critics and what they think. We haven't even gotten to fans and what they think. We're just talking about people who are looking at the process. Just the process itself is what they're seeing as the main aspect. So someone says, I work very hard on my stuff. You know, I work this hard on it. Um, I spend this much. I use these tools. I use this technique to create my art. And that is where they find value in their own art. Um, you know, how hard I work on it or work to create it is where I get the value. And sometimes you'll get the inverse, where I can do this in this amount of hours. I do this. I mean, I remember on a lot of the music forums used to be how many songs can you create in a week? How many beats can you make in a day? How long does it take you to do an art page? How long does it take you to come up with a sketch? How long does it take to do all these things? On, on a certain level, it's important for the industry sense that you've, you know, if you remember my three C's video, you got to be able to create the content. So if you're spending six months to make a page for your comic, you're not going to go very far. If the client gives you a deadline of two and a half weeks, but you can't complete a piece, you know, without having four weeks, you're not going to make it. Same thing. If they say have this done by Monday, you're not going to be able to really rock if it takes you weeks to get something done. And that could be either you in front of your own way or you haven't mastered your process enough to make it quick enough that it's efficient that you can get the work done in a certain amount of time. But the artist part is important because artists understand your process. They know what you did most times to create your art. We're not talking about fans of an artist who just love what you do because that's something different. We're talking about the artist and they understand what you do to create your art and therefore they have a deep insight in knowing how you made it. And because they understand the production tools, they use the same tools, they can sort of look at your art and understand what you went through to create it and have an appreciation. So there is a value to be gained when other artists appreciate your work or art other artists um, respect your work or respect your process and understand it. Critics are important because they give you historical content, uh, context, I'm sorry. Uh, they let you know where you are among all those that have done it before. Historical context is important. 
if you're doing something that's been done a hundred times before, critics will tell you that you're repeating, you know, old steps. They'll tell you that. They'll let you know that's what you're doing. Um, if you're too derivative, you're copying, you're, you're following, they'll let you know. They also understand the tools that you use to convey your meaning. So they understand the tools that a writer might use. They understand, you know, what you what you're trying to get to. They understand what you're trying to 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 convey and say with your work, and they can judge your effectiveness and how well you use the tools, you use all the techniques, and how the process goes. But the most important part for a critic is that they have usually seen the most. And that's almost like a prerequisite for being a critic is that you have to know a lot about it. You need to know the history of where, where it's been. You need to know the current state that it's at. And usually you've got to guess for the future. But for the most part, that's what a critic does. It's historical context. You know where this work lies in the place of everything. Different than an artist who might have a favorite. I keyed in on this one guy that did this in whatever year it was, and that's the guy I'm copying. Or that's the guy that when I was being imprinted upon, that's the guy's footsteps I'm trying to follow in. And that's where I'm going with my art. So that's all I'm fixated on. As a critic, you might need to understand what was going on besides that. And what's going on in the world of today, how does this fit in the world of what's been doing? You're going to judge one movie by itself. You kind of need to know what's, what's gone on in that series before so we can understand what the new one is trying to do. Is it going above and beyond? Is it breaking some of the rules? Is it, is it, is it um, conquering new ground? What is it doing? That's where the critic is necessary, which is different than an artist. Um, the last is the fan. And the fan is really about the word effectiveness. So fan, I like to say, is either like or don't like. And that's really as simple as it takes to be a fan. You either say, hey, I like this or I don't like this. Either this was good or it wasn't. And we don't have to go too far into the politics of it. We don't have to struggle with, you know, um, well, he spent this long making it or they spent this much money making this movie or those are things for the other aspects to worry about. As a fan, either you liked it or you didn't. You know, if you've if you've copied seven other movies, critics may beat you on the head for that. All the artists may say, oh, my goodness, this person's a hack. He's just copying all these other movies. If you as a fan haven't seen the other movies and it doesn't distract or detract from your enjoyment, you're not gonna give the movie a hit for that. You're gonna say it was great, it was a good romp, I had a lot of fun, I enjoyed the movie. And critics will be upset that the person is either copying, snatching, plagiarizing, whatever. And an artist might be upset because, you know, they're tapping into something or someone that they believe is a revered person. You should never touch their work. You should never try to repeat this. The first version of this was so good. How dare this person come along and try to do it again? And that's where you get a little bit of a difference uh, of the three different avenues. And you find that when you place a lot of weight or power in any of these areas, you get some weird things. If you place a lot of weight on the critic, you get what we get, what we call uh, gatekeepers. And this becomes people that believe they're the ones deciding whether something is good or not. And that's the weird part that happens sometimes that you get a gatekeeper. And that's a person that will sort of think they are the ones deciding what's good and what's not. And they make a gate, a literal gate or a filter that says this is not going to get through. Like this isn't worthy to be given to the masses, which is different than the fans feeding the critics, different than the fans feeding the artists. This is the critic deciding as the first responder, so to speak, that they're going to decide how good something is. So we're not going to share this with the masses. I'm not going to put it on my site because I don't think this is hot or I don't think this is where this should go next. I don't think this is relevant or I don't even like the source. It could even be the artist hasn't done whatever it takes to get through the gatekeeper. And it's not based on the value of your actual art. It's the opinion of the critic. And when you deposit a lot of power in this one area, you begin to get that sort of thing. If you deposit a lot of power with the fans, they begin to lose these two parts of the process and it becomes about satisfying their fan, re their fan desires, which a lot of it is fanfic. Um, you can have fan picks. Um, 
what are those other phrases? There's a lot of phrases for that when you just do stuff for the fans, which I'm gonna call that pandering because that really is kind of what that boils down to that you're pandering to a fan base and you're not really trying to say anything with substance. You're just sort of putting something out there, hoping that it's gonna work, hoping that it sort of catches on, hoping that, you know, um, because they like what came before, they're gonna like this too. And you tend to break away from the actual artist, which is the creating the process, right? You create the thing of value to be sent out to the critics and the fans. You begin to start to create for the fans first. And that's usually what takes the hit with the critics because they understand that you're breaking the artistic vision and you're going straight to whatever might work with fans. And also, don't forget, if the art was the first thing that happens, the fans like what the artist does. And that's different than, that's the wife calling, right in the middle. Um, that's different, I'll probably edit that out, or not. Um, is what it is. But uh, yeah, so you begin to feed directly to the fans and you're ignoring the artistic vision of creating or even thinking about breaking new ground or doing something different. And that really becomes a problem when a brand or an IP or, an, or a product or project has a long history. And the long history, you can see how these begin to add up. When a product that has a long history and we sort of have a context of how things work, it sets up rules. And some of these rules, some of the fans enforce. Like, hey, this happened in part one, this happened in part two, this is logical for happening in part three. So you have an expectation of how the story should go. And you can break that up with a surprise, with a twist and a turn, because sometimes you'll even notice it's not that far fetched to have an artist create a work that has left turns in it where it was going a certain way, boom, here's a surprise. It was gonna go this way and then I took it this other way and it becomes surprising. Well, sometimes if you get to the fan part, you begin to think that's all you need to keep doing and you begin to create it artificially. Where it's not born from a vision, it's born from trying to fulfill an expectation. Like this is what the franchise used to do, so I'm gonna keep doing it. And that's sometimes what happens when the fans become a little bit too powerful, where those early reviews become, you know, what supersedes everything. Well, we better get to make something that, you know, the opening week and it does well. We're not really worried about longevity or it surviving a long time. We just got to get past that initial buzz of the fans and get them to like what we're seeing. A lot of times you're hearing the fans commenting on things that they really don't know a whole lot about. Right, you have a movie, you leak a little scene or two, and fans begin to sort to try to, to give you what the critics should say and what an artist should be responding to from a very little information. If it's a movie, you haven't seen the movie, but boy, do you have a thousand theories and thoughts and votes. You're ready to vote a movie down that you haven't seen yet. You're ready to say that this thing isn't good, but you haven't even seen it because you're thinking I can extrapolate from this small amount of information and I just get the whole thing. That sometimes becomes a, pro a problem. There are people that are critical and you find yourself when you're dealing with a certain sense that when you become that gatekeeper and you begin to believe that you have an influence on the fans, you begin to become, that's how you get to that shill area where now you think as a critic, it's no longer your job to judge historical context and whether something has worked or not that you're now thinking that your opinion is going to decide whether fans like it or dislike it and that's a self-thought where you're saying to yourself well i better say something good because i'm in this league or i'm i have a a connection with this brand so i better say something good even though as a critic i really should be slamming it for certain things i'm going to give it a pass and that's that same thought process. There's so much power put into the critic that you begin to think I'm the one that's gonna decide whether or not fans like it or not. As if a critic is gonna let me know. The whole point of being a critic is to let me know if a movie or a product is worth my time. Is this worth checking out? That's the whole point. And then the secondary level of a critic is to reinforce or change my perspective. Where I saw the movie, maybe there's a valuable insight. You know, looking at something years later, you can review a work once again. But that's what sometimes happens when you put a lot of power 
into the fan area that it sort of does distort this entire. Now, artists on the other end, when you give them a lot of power, they begin to become obsessed with the process, which reflects back to this. And you have the artist that, what shall we call that? We'll call that the, the imposter, the imposter, what is that called? The imposter paradox, the imposter syndrome. I think it's called the imposter syndrome. I could be wrong. Don't hate me if I'm wrong. We're going off the head. But the imposter syndrome, if I remember correctly, is when you think you're a hack and that you don't deserve your fame or your credit. And uh, I believe that is tied to how much you work on your, your, your product. And you, if you don't feel like you've worked hard enough, you begin to see luck and fate as being the reason you're here. And where that, underneath that definition and surface level understanding, there is a darker part, which is as an artist, through your process and trying to streamline your process, get it better, shorten it, sharpen it, get better mastery of your tools, that you stop, your, your art production or music production stops becoming work. And, and this is a critical point for an artist to understand. What you do, if creating your art is work, you either haven't mastered your tools or your technique. And I'll say that again because a lot of times when I say things, people like to misquote what I've said and we end up having arguments over things that I never said. What I'm saying is, if you creating art is hard work, you haven't mastered your tools or your technique. That's the problem. This is different than saying you won't work hard at your art. That's different than saying you won't work hard at your art. You will work hard at your art, but doing art is not hard work. Let's understand the difference. That is from the paradox of trying to make your stuff as easy as possible. You want to streamline your process. You want to get all your shortcuts done. You want to arrange all of your brushes. You want to get all your beats organized in a folder. If you're a DJ, you want to get your mix list together, your playlist. You want to get everything arranged. You want to get your pre-production going. Um, if you're an artist that uses any sort of samples or collage or assets, you want a massive library so you can easily pick and choose. You want to organize your library so you can find what you need and you want to be able to fire off and get your stuff going immediately. You don't want to battle your production process in order to get to your art. So therefore you spend a lot of time, your feng shui, you, your studio, building it to be the ultimate place that you're comfortable in, creating an atmosphere that you can work in, trying to get the distractions out the way, trying to get enough equipment, your tools. You spend a lot of time obsessing on that. But you also don't care what someone else does. But if you spend too much time in that artist phrase, what's important to you, you begin to think is important to the art, and it's not. I don't care about your studio. I don't care what you use. I don't care what kind of brushes or what size you work in. I don't care as an artist what you're doing in your studio. I obsess over me and my process, and I obsess over my studio, and I do a ton of research before I buy something. I look into everything, I'm on the internet, I'm Googling, I'm on Amazon reviews, I'm looking into all of this stuff, I'm asking questions, what's the best this, what's the best EQ, what's the best drum machine, what's the best synthesizer, what's the best tablet, what's the best, the best brush size, what's the best rendering engine, what's the best this, that's what you do as an artist. And the earlier you are in the process, the more important that is. I must have the best everything to get my art to be done, I must. That's early. When you're late in it and you've done it for a while, you begin to realize it's all, it's all subjective. Whatever you like to use, whatever you're comfortable using, you're gonna use that. Doesn't have to be the most expensive thing. There's people who grab something cheap and their first tool is the one they keep to the end of their careers because it's the one they're comfortable with. It's the, it's the uh, environment they're very comfortable in. You know, it's not the best product to do anything, but it's the one that they're comfortable with and they use that. And at the end of it, we judge by the results, right? We slide down to the fan area and we look at your finished work and we judge you based on that. 
mostly that's the end result, right? The critics aren't looking at an unfinished movie, an unfinished product. They're not looking, you're not gonna write a review over an unfinished sketch, you know, a, a, a beta version of a piece of software that's being beta tested. You can't write your final review of that. You need to see it released and in its finished sense. If you put too much weight in this artist area, you begin to have people obsessed with the process and you're allowed to be judged by your process. Your sketches become all you share all day. You don't have any finished actual art prints. You don't have any work that you're standing behind. You don't have any finished songs. You've got ideas and beats. And the further you go back, the, the earlier that you begin to seek credit. At a certain level, if you've already been out there in the world and shared a finished product or project, you don't care about the very beginnings. You don't care about an artist's idea. You don't care about the name of a proposed work. You know, this is a guy I just came up with. This is a, a sketch. This is a, a framework that I've got. Hey, I've got an idea for my next book. No one cares about that unless you deposit a lot of interest in this beginning part. You have to almost live the artist. And that's what happens if you have like a forum of all artists. You begin, what was the last thing you just worked on? Show me your last sketch. What was the last sentence you wrote? And this is all the enjoyment of being at the very beginning of the process. Being an artist, relishing being an artist, which really isn't about getting to that next step, which is having something that's finished that can be judged by a critic or even enjoyed by a fan that you're staying in that zone and that's good enough. And it can feed into itself where you have people enjoying sketches for two years. And I, because I get a lot of feedback from my sketches, I never get past that first hurdle and get something done. That would go back to my other video, the three C's of uh, being an artist, that you're enjoying the creative process, but you're never really going to full term. The other part of it is the critic thing. If you put a lot of critics together, they begin to believe that the rules that they go by, the historical context, you could say, well, since this was the golden age of this, everything that came after it should be dismissed, right? We see that in music. This was the golden age, and this is when things were good. And because we're no longer in the golden age, everything kind of sucks. And I'm free to not even absorb it, not look at the historical context. I'm gonna put all my weight early, which is as a critic, early, right, which is your era, when I was into this heavy, this is what was hot. So therefore, for the rest of my life, the only thing that can be hot is things done this way in this era. And therefore, you're beginning to use the historical context as an excuse not to enjoy anything else past that beginning part, which is why I say it's early, because if you've been a long time critic, you've seen things change over decades. And you can kind of understand the historical context that time moves on, right? 50s music, 60s music, 70s music, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010. So if you're still stuck on, you know, 1999 and that being the golden age of anything, yeah, you're not going to be able to relate to stuff coming out in 2020. It's just, it's just a completely different engine because you've lost your historical context because you're no longer listening anymore. You stopped listening at the part that you believe was your own golden age. The same idea with the fans, fans begin to drive the work and say, well, because I want this, this is no longer any good. Because it's not like how this, this one was when I became a fan of the franchise, nothing can be good as what I was birthed into. Because I was at my most impressionable age. If I saw this when I was a teen, that's it. That was my golden era and everything after that doesn't count. So you can get a lot of interesting things happen when you put them together. Um, if you have a lot of fans together in their own world, you know, as a critic, it, they'll believe that they have a better understanding of what's effective and not. So whether you enjoy something, like you can enjoy garbage, which is also sometimes the problem with all of these things fitting together. As a fan, you can enjoy fast food. And you can sit there in a, rest, in a, in a, in a fast food place, a restaurant, and be eating a, a piece of fast food and enjoy it. So no one can tell you that you're not enjoying what you're enjoying. So as a fan, if your only two buttons is on, off, and maybe there's a third, which is, you know, uh, don't care. But if you're going to say, hey, I enjoy this meal, that enjoyment isn't just enough to go on. That's why fans can't be the only value of art. 
because a critic may understand that you're eating fast food. And although it's enjoyable, a critic may understand that it's fast food. That's why we kind of need to look at all three and understand the process. If someone is going to say, well, hey, this chain is very popular, everyone loves it. A critic can keep saying, hey, you know, this is terrible, but an artist might understand that there's a certain process to creating it. And there is an art form in creating something that's very quick, very satisfying, and even disposable. If that's the point of your art, then there's actually a value that that's how it's received. And a critic could be also commenting on what your intentions are and say, well, you know, who's going to complain about some, some of the food levels for a fast food place? It's not a restaurant. You're getting your food in three minutes, not 45 to an hour like a restaurant. They're, the whole point is you cannot spend an hour making fast food. It has to be made quickly. You also want it cheap. I know how much a restaurant costs. It's five to six times a fast food place. So you expect that these factors in. But if you don't and you just go to a critic who's not thinking in any of those ways, you could have a very harsh review for something that's actually meant to go from the artist in a quick sense to the fans. And the critic needs to understand the context of what the artist is working in. That this is meant to be fast food. Is it good fast food? Are they delivering it quickly? Is it delivered cheaply? And does it satisfy for the moment? Not long term, but for the moment, which is what it's for. And it is disposable. Right? Not meant to be heated up later. Excellent food heats up a day later. It tastes really good when it's heated up. Fast food doesn't. Once it gets cold, it's pretty much a wrap most of it but if you understand those things you understand what we're all balancing the intention of the artist the context the historical remember that that you that's that's your primary judging angle historical context and also the fan that your enjoyment of on and off has to also accept the fact that there's an artist intention behind it and if the artist isn't intending for you to receive it a certain way because it's not your cup of tea or because you don't respond to it doesn't mean that this person hasn't done something in a historical context worthy of note or that as an artist they've accomplished their goal and accomplished their artistic vision. Just because it's not what you were expecting or what you were desiring or what you wanted does not depreciate the other two areas that, the, that it could be judged for value. That's why I've always said you judge all three connect together. So if you're going to create art, uh, fantasy-wise, you'd, you'd want all three to be in a line. You want other people who do what you do. If you draw, other people who draw. If you do CGI art, other people who do CGI art. If you make beats, people who make beats. All of it. The same techniques, the same tools. Those that are doing the same thing you're doing. You want them to be un to understand your effectiveness and your respect for the process, right? They would know whether or not you're a hack. They would know whether you've ripped from another artist who may not be out. So a critic may not be understanding who else is in the underground with you. And a critic may not understand your process and what you're doing. They might just see the result and say, wow, this looks great. But as an artist, you know how they got there. So if you can get the respect of all the artists without overly doing it, so that your whole goal for creating art isn't to please other artists because that's when you push the envelope too hard and you spend too much time worrying about the process and the technical difficulty of your work and not the overall effectiveness of what you've done. So you've got to balance that to be a true artist and get the respect of the other artists. The same thing with critics. If all you're doing is sharing sketches with other artists and they go, wow, you draw great or wow, we like this process or wow, you work hard on that. We need to have people who understand everything else that's going on in the larger world to judge your work. And they can understand from historical context how good is what you're doing. Where are you going with what you're doing? That's important to understand. For fans, it's a matter of pleasing somebody, right? You want to have readers. If you're doing a book, you want readers to enjoy it. You want them to have the like, the like response to what you're creating. You want them to be able to appreciate it. At the same time, you don't want to put too much investment in that and get to a point where the only thing that you're doing is working for fans and you're willing to, to take from the process or subtract 
from the critic area and just try to go straight to fans and say, okay, this is this is true garbage, but if I can just get initial buzz going, um, there's a danger to all of these by placing too much value or too little value. But that would be your, your, your fantasy as an artist, to have other artists appreciate your work and respect what you've done, respect your technique and how much you've put into it to create your art, have critics understand the, 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 the tools that you've used to convey your message and get it out there and be able to appreciate that you have a sense of history and you're trying to add on or create a new voice or do something that's building upon what's already been there, that would be good for a critic to say, okay, this is a true, you know, if you're following in footsteps, this is a true heir to the legacy. If you're breaking new ground, wow, this is new and fresh. You know, that's a good thing for critics to say, hey, everyone check this out, this is worth doing. You know, that this becomes a thing that also reflects back. And for fans to enjoy it, Obviously, you know, there's a business sense to all of this, but for fans to enjoy it and have it have some staying power and do both. It has the fast food effect that they get it right off a snap. They're into it from the very beginning. It doesn't have to be a cult favorite that like five years later, people understand what it is or a decade or after the artist dies, they understand what he was doing. You know, you want that real time understanding and also you want to be able to build fans over time. People who might have missed it the first time around understand what it is from both the other artists who appreciate it and the critics and also fans spread the word and it grows beyond. But this is something to just basically be aware of is sometimes when you find yourself hearing strange arguments, you got to kind of understand where these things are coming from. If you're an artist trying to understand people's relation or reaction to your work, you might want to understand these three first. Is this person another artist? Because an artist is going to respond to your work a certain way with their own criteria, which is usually about the process. You use this. You don't use this. This takes this long. This is this hard to use. I'm doing it the hardest way possible. It's, it's a lot of work to create what I create. You know, that's the artist relishing in being an artist. For a critic, you want to have some reflection of people looking at your work in a finished context. That it can't just be people looking at your work process and evaluating what you do based on your working process. You want to see what happens when we get to the end. Where's the polish? Where's the final delivery? Where's the real context of when this arrives? Right? We can imagine a bunch, well, if this comes out, it could do well. Or if this does this, if you were to share this, it might do this. You know, a critic might want to just see the final stage. Like, okay, well, let me see what you meant to do. You know, you hear a lot of the disclaimers. Well, this is just something I'm working on. Or I'm just a hobby. This is just my hobby. Or I only do this in my spare time. Or I'm not really that serious. Or I'm not in it for the money. And all of these parts become the excuses for the artist not to get to the end of the process. And deliver something that's worthy to be judged by critics and fans. It's a built-in excuse never to have to really cross that line and be able to stand behind your work and say, okay, well, this is finished. This is what I meant to present. So when you judge it, it's now yours. This is no longer mine. This is now yours. And part of that is letting go of your art and letting it be given to the world of critics and fans. When you have a disclaimer, well, this isn't finished yet. I'm still saying it's mine. And you can peep at it, but you can't really judge it fully because it's still mine. I'm still working on it safety net and of course you want the fans to enjoy your work and have an appreciation of it and have an understanding of it and you need that because critics could look at your technical process or your execution and think it's really good and another artist can respect your work and think you've really gone deep on it but if you can't really garner any attention of fans and people appreciating it like i said we haven't really discussed money in this we haven't discussed any industry. We haven't discussed business concepts and the heaviness of those contexts because these three things kind of influence that. These three things sort of dictate how they respond, right? You can't really sell something until it's available to be sold. So to worry about the business part or selling something, it usually has to have hit one of these areas that you've done already to set that up. So we're not gonna really worry about that for now. But I think I've said all I need to say about this. It's the value of art. We're looking at it from three different perspectives. If you find yourself embroiled in some strange conversation that don't quite make sense, you probably want to evaluate who is saying this to you. Is it a fan responding? Is it a critic? Is it another artist? And you'll sort of hear different um, feedbacks from these three different groups. And it's usually in context. And sometimes there's a gray where there's a person who's an artist who jumps to become a critic and starts to be an artist being critical. 
which is a little bit different than being a critic. You're just an artist who's being a critical, is being critical. Sometimes you have a critic who also draws and you'll get, you know, if I was doing this, I would do that. Or if that's really a critic who's, who's adding his own artistic sensibility, I would do this, I would have done that. You should have done this, you should have done that. That's how you get to the critic who's being an artist. And I like your stuff, I don't like your stuff. You know, this sucks, this is great, this is whatever. That's a fan parading as any one of these, you know, who's gonna comment. And that's usually a very big taboo to be an artist and speak like a fan. Because it's really rare for an artist, um, just like a, a sports athlete, boxer, fighter of any kind, uh, anything with competition in it, the individual person thinks they're the best. And that's not something that you dispute. Every person who does something competitively, if you get to any point past absolute beginner, you believe you're the best. And if you don't think you're the best, you believe that you're on your way to being the best and you're going along your process and getting better. And if you believe yourself to have fully mastered what you're trying to do, you'd be the best. And that's different than a fan who's gonna argue who's better than who. Who do I like more? And these kind of things go on forever because fans are very subjective. You can change something, you know, you can be someone's favorite without actually being the best. So as far as fans go, they can change your criteria and make anything they want be important, which is the right of a fan. You get to say, I like this, I don't like this. And whatever reasons you pick, it's fair. So whatever the fans say is what goes. You have given them your project. It's theirs to judge, like or dislike. And that's really the end of it. So you don't really have to argue with fans about something. It just is what it is when they take it and they have their response to it. The same thing with critics. You don't have to argue with a critic. That's their take on it. Um, a lot of it can be useful information all the ways around, you know? And sometimes it's good to let one thing feed back on the other. The, if you say this sucks, but the fans go crazy, you've probably forgot the artistic principles inside of it and what they were going for. You know, if you're saying that this is garbage movie, but the fans go nuts over it, you probably missed the context of the movie. And you didn't understand what the artist was going for that may have worked with the fans because you were busy looking for it in a different context than the movie was supposed to be in. So the same thing happens. It's usually that third component. When two don't connect properly, there's usually a third component that doesn't make sense. And as an artist, it's usually taboo to speak like a fan and be arguing over who's better than who. That's not really the kind of thing that an artist would really do. Because you're mostly concerned as an artist of being the best that you can be. Me being better than this guy or better than that guy isn't gonna matter among these two. I'm gonna be judged in historical context, not the one person I'm worried about. It's gonna be historical context. Everybody I'm gonna be judged against. Not there's this one guy that I've picked out to say I'm better than him. That doesn't even make any sense. And fans usually decide that kind of stuff over time. So for me to advocate it makes no sense. But on a personal level, I believe I'm the best and my process is the best and I'm the truest and I'm the grandest and I'm the greatest at it. That should be my belief for my confidence. That's what's making me go out there and struggle against adversity and in rough spots, I'm overcoming them and I'm going up against obstacles. That's what's driving me forward. I believe, hey, if I can beat all of this, I will emerge as the best at least the best version of me that I can be. Doesn't mean critics are gonna like it. It doesn't mean that fans are gonna get it or that what I've created is the right thing to do at the right time and all those other aspects of it might not line up properly. Doesn't mean that, my, my, that I didn't accomplish my artistic vision. That's why most times it's the safest thing to do is stick to your artistic vision and get it right with an understanding of where you are in history. If you can understand enough of your history to know that you're not repeating someone else or how your work's gonna be received to what everyone else is doing, you know, as an artist, you should be aware of that and you should understand what fans respond to. So in a certain sense, you need to understand how to deliver it. It doesn't really make sense if you're gonna do that and create art for yourself completely, then we don't really have to worry about sharing it. It's not gonna make it to critics and you're not gonna share it for fans. But once you decide to enter this world and put it out there, then these things become something worth thinking about. And as I've covered earlier, I won't repeat myself. It's not worth obsessing over, but it is worth understanding. All right, I think that's enough. Um, if you guys comment or talk about this, maybe I'll do a follow-up if there's something that I've been unclear on, or we can go over some other ideas. But I got a bunch of these coming. I just think it's interesting that when I watch people argue or have discussions about the nature of art, this is the last stuff that pops up, so I made a video about it. 
which again is not for everybody so uh it is what it is thank you very much for watching this is uh drew spence from the dynamic universe griffin avid shout out thanks for the media edit put some music behind this and uh that's it i will see you guys later thank you for tuning in like and subscribe share it with your friends debate and argue all that good stuff let's keep this going thank you purse